Welcome to Horizon Church Online. I'm so glad you're here with us this Sunday. And I'm so excited because I get to officially announce our new worship leader. Marissa is going to start with us September 27th. You'll see her today on the online service. And then come out next week at The Rock at 10 a.m. and meet her and her husband and her kids. Uh, we're so excited that they are joining our Horizon family. Now, today we have a great service. We're going to continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount. And if this is your first time ever watching digitally, virtually, visiting with us, we're so glad you're here. Shoot us a direct message via social. Let us know you're there because every first time viewer, we donate $10 to Compassion International. By watching today, you're helping a child in a third world country escape poverty. So thank you for being here. We pray today that this brings you closer to God, that it encourages you to keep going this week and gives you hope that we're going to get through this together. Let's jump in.
When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. What lengths are you willing to go to in order to live and love like Jesus? Think about that. I mean, are there limits to what you're willing to do or what you're willing to give up or what it might cost you? Or is there a limit? Is there a line where you say, I'm not going to go past that? As Jesus is teaching the Sermon on the Mount, as he's teaching how to live and love like he does, how to be his disciple, a student, a practitioner, an apprentice to his way of life, he's going to bring us to some lines and see whether or not we're really committed to him. Over and over again, in the next few weeks, we're going to look at these teachings of Jesus, and he starts off with a uh, quote from the Old Testament. He'll say, you have heard it said, and then he'll build upon that, and he'll say, but for my disciples, you need to go a step farther. It's not just this, it's actually something even more. Now, he started off with this long introduction that we've covered over the last few weeks, but now he's rapid fire into these principles about living and loving like he does. In Matthew 5, verses 27 through 30, we're going to look at today, Jesus says, You've heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. This is a quote from the Old Testament. These are good Jewish people who have grown up hearing and learning and obeying the Old Testament forever. But he says, to be my disciple, it's a step farther. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It's better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go to hell. And I'm like, okay, Jesus, I'm committed to be your disciple. So let's go. You know, that's obviously not what he's saying. So put your axes away, you know, put your swords away. Um, it's really heavy. I mean, he's like, cut off your body, gouge out your eye. This is dark, heavy stuff. But almost all scholars agree, Jesus isn't talking about physically maiming yourself or cutting off your body parts. Um, and there's good reason to see that he's not saying that. The text itself lends to that interpretation. Jesus just got done saying that murder isn't something you just do with your hands or with a weapon. Murder is something that happens in your heart and happens with your words. And then he goes, adultery is not just something you do with your body. It's also something you do with your mind. And then he says, so cut off your body. Obviously, what he's saying is what we really need is not for our body to be ripped apart, but for our minds to be re formed, our hearts to be reformed. You see his point. You can cut out all the sinful parts of your body and you'd still have a sinful mind. You'd still have a sinful heart. You and I need someone to do radically invasive surgery on our souls, to radically uh, cut out the broken and the dead parts of our inner being. Now, I believe we can cooperate with this operation or we can resist it. You know, some of us need to be strapped down for Jesus to do some spiritual surgery and some of us willingly go to the operating table and we submit to the surgery that we know that we need. I love what C.S. Lewis says in his great book, Mere Christianity. Imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild that house, and at first, perhaps, you can understand what he is doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on, and you knew that all those jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts horribly and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth could he be up to? The explanation is that he's building quite a different house from the one you thought of, throwing out a new wing here, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but actually he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. That's been so true in my life. Like, 
you, you become a follower of Jesus and you're like, man, I've got some messy stuff that needs taken care of. And pretty soon you realize that Jesus wants to dig deeper than just your surface level sins. Becoming an apprentice of Jesus and his way of life won't just fix some of the embarrassing moral shortcomings that you have in your life. Jesus wants to do a complete remodel of your inner being. Jesus wants to do invasive surgery and get to the very root of our most destructive issues. So as we look at our next principle of living and loving like Jesus, listed here in this verse, these verses, we must conclude that a student of Jesus will go to radical lengths to guard what they look at and what they long for. A disciple will go to radical lengths to quench lust, and lust is desiring beauty, desiring something good that doesn't belong to you. Now, we can't make a statement like this, we can't read a passage like this without talking about the realities of pornography in our world today. Porn's an epidemic, 79% of men 18 through 30 watch porn at least once a month, 76% of women 18 through 30 watch porn at least once a month. By 13, 93% of boys and 62% of girls have been exposed to porn online. And you say, Alex, so what's the big deal? If everybody's doing it and everybody's been there, like, what does it matter? Can't we just let this thing go? Well, I'm not a neuroscientist, but the little bit I've read about neuroscience, uh, CREB, this protein that's built up in your mind when you do repetitive activities and it releases... Um, stimuli to say, hey, keep doing this. This feels good. Don't do this. Essentially, porn rewires your mind. What you look at, what you long for, what you go to to bring you peace or pleasure actually ends up rewiring your brain. Now, you might say, Alex, I don't have a porn problem. Like, so these verses obviously don't apply to me and I'm all good. I'm living and loving like Jesus. Well, you may not have a porn problem, but we all have a lust problem. Porn is not just naked people or erotic images. It can be, we can lust after people's bodies, but we can also lust after their houses, after their families, after their careers, or after their adventures. It's called Instagram, right? That's where people go to lust after other people's lives. In 1 John 2 verses 15 through 17, it says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and all of its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Now, I believe that porn and lust are symptoms of a deeper sin. If we aren't grateful for what we have, we will be envious of what someone else has. A lack of gratitude always leads to lust. Often, lust feels like the easy way to medicate a deep human longing for something that you need, something good that you want and desire that's good for you to have but you don't have right now. And lust seems like a way for you to get as close as you can. When you try to meet a real need in the wrong way, you always end up more empty. What we look at, what we long for, affects who we become and it affects what we feel and how we process our feelings in our lives. In Matthew 6, verses 22 through 23, Jesus said, The eye is the lamp of the body. This is a little bit farther along in the Sermon on the Mount. We're going to get to this in a few weeks. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is actually dark, how great is that darkness? See, our eyes are the doorways to our soul. What we look at affects the health of our soul. Our spiritual health is affected by what we look at and what we long for. If we stare at the image of a naked person, our soul gets sick. We see people as objects. If we stare at the perfectly curated family our friend puts on Instagram, our soul gets sick. We become discontent and envious. Guard what you look at because it affects what you feel and who you are becoming. It affects your spiritual well-being. Uh, remember that movie Pirates of the Caribbean? The first one was really good and all the rest were terrible. In the first one, Barbosa, the bad guy, he's been cursed by this 
uh, this cursed gold, and he lives a half-life as a living pirate skeleton. And uh, he's talking about it in this one scene where he says no matter what he drinks, he's still thirsty because he pours wine and it just runs through his skeleton body. You know, no matter how many apples he eats, he's always hungry. No matter who he sleeps with, he's always filled with lust. He says lust, I, I think that this is a great example of what lust is like. Lust is eating shadows. It never satisfies your real needs. It is looking for sustenance in something that has no substance. Anytime we reduce people from being a reflection of God's nature and character into something less, we make people into objects to be used by us instead of people to be served by us. Lust is looking at someone and stripping away everything that makes them a human, and in doing so, we become less human ourselves. And social media is terrible at this. People become objects of the life that we want or objects of the person we wish we could have or we wish we were instead of humans, humans made in the image of God. Now, a message like this, maybe you've already clicked off at this point. You're like, man, this just, this wore me out. You know, Alex, uh, this has made me feel so guilty and shameful and broken. And I just feel terrible after a message like this. Uh, the, a message like this can make us collapse into shame, but it shouldn't. Shame doesn't change who we are. It changes what we do. And we want a deeper change than just our outward behavior. Grace changes who we are. And when we're a different person, we act differently. God's affection for you isn't based on your character, how well you measure up and what you did or didn't do. It's based on Jesus's character and how he perfectly measured up and how he lived the perfect human life that we can't. Now, the selfish, destructive actions we take limit how much we can enjoy the abundant life that Jesus has made available to us through his death and resurrection, but his love for you doesn't change based on how well you're performing. To paraphrase Dallas Willard, I think our takeaway should be, we must ruthlessly eliminate anything that prevents us from living and loving like Jesus. We must go to radical lengths to avoid or remove anything that prevents us from enjoying the abundant life and made, made available to us through the life and death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Now, Willard, one of the things he mentions, he says, we must ruthlessly eliminate hurry in our lives if we're to live and love like Jesus. I think that's very true. And I think that he would be okay with me adding envy and lust to that list as well. We must ruthlessly eliminate envy out of our life. Maybe that means deleting all your social media accounts because every time you get on there, you see what someone else has and you wish you had it and you forget to be thankful for what you have. Maybe um, ruthlessly eliminating lust in your life means getting rid of your cell phone. And you think, how could I live in a world today without that? Ruthlessly eliminate anything that stands in the way of you living and loving like Jesus. It'll be hard. It'll be difficult. People may be confused by it, but you will know it. you've made the right decision. Anything that robs your life of the goodness that apprenticeship to Jesus provides must be ruthlessly eliminated from our lives. So what do we do? Replace the lust in your life with Sabbath and Thanksgiving. Sabbath is when you stop working, you stop striving, you stop trying to obtain, and you sit back and enjoy everything that God has already given you. You nap and you rest and you eat. You get outside and you enjoy the beauties of nature. You thank God for everything that you have. And what happens is you stop longing for what you don't when you start appreciating what you already have. Sometimes we long for something else and as soon as we get it, there's something new for us to long for because we've never learned to be content. If you aren't content right now, gaining something won't make you content. There'll be something new that you long and lust for. Second, ruthlessly eliminate any selfish, destructive things in your life that prevent you from living and loving like Jesus. Don't cut off your hands or gouge out your eyes, but there may be things in your life that you need to cut out of your schedule, that you need to cut out of your possessions, that you need to cut out of your routine in order to ruthlessly eliminate the self-destructive things that keep you from enjoying the abundant life 
that Jesus has made available to us. These are our announcements for September 20th, 2020. If you'd like to give to support the work of Horizon, you can do so online on our website or via Venmo or PayPal. This Wednesday, we'll have another short prayer walk to pray for the needs of our community. If you have any questions or concerns, contact us via email or text. We'd love to connect with you. We return to in-person services at The Rock, September 27th at 10 a.m. We pray that the Holy Spirit empowers you to ruthlessly eliminate anything that stands in the way of you living and loving like Jesus this week.